Hello, and welcome to the latest installment of Look and Listen, our monthly online exploration of the intersection of art and music. I'm Carrie Roeder, Curatorial Fellow in American Art at the Freer and Sackler Galleries, which together form the National Museum of Asian Art at the Smithsonian. Today, we are joined on piano by Brian Gans, who is artist in residence and a member of the piano faculty at St. Mary's College of Maryland. He also serves on the piano faculty at the Peabody Conservatory. Brian Gans was a top prize winner at two of the world's most prestigious piano competitions and has since appeared with the St. Louis Symphony Orchestra, the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra, the National Philharmonic, and the City of London Sinfonia. In 2019, he performed at the Freer and Sackler in a program exploring the musical connections to Whistler's famous 10 o'clock lecture. You can watch a video of that performance on our website. We just heard Brian perform an excerpt from Voile from the first book of Preludes by French composer Claude Debussy, who will be the musical focus of our program, alongside the artwork of American expatriate artist James McNeil Whistler. These two artists are deeply connected in a variety of ways. As we'll see, the title of the piano work, Voile, can be translated as Veils, and is an apt introduction to today's exploration of connections between the music of Debussy and the art of Whistler. In particular, we'll spend some time comparing Debussy's music with Whistler's Nocturnes, where he uses the concept of the veil to cloak industrial London in tonal washes, reveling in a moody darkness. But first, let's look at one of Whistler's most famous treatments of the urban landscape, which also foregrounds his enthusiasm for Japanese art and culture. His early costume piece, Variations in Flesh Color and Green, The Balcony. Whistler began this painting in 1864, though it was not completed until 1879, when it was displayed at the Westminster Palace Hotel, alongside his controversial nocturnes. Whistler was among the earliest of Western artists to collect Japanese art, and his embrace of Japanese ma is on full display here. The composition features the balcony of Whistler's home studio on Lindsay Row in Chelsea, overlooking the Thames, with a view of Battersea on the south bank of the river. We see four languid women in Japanese kimonos. The horizontal railing creates a visual divide separating the reverie of the foreground from the monochrome brownish grays of the Battersea factories and slag heap that line the horizon. A woman in a pinkish peach kimono reclines on the floor with a Japanese tea set in front of her while one arm is raised holding a fan. Behind her, a standing figure with reddish hair looks out from the balcony toward the right. A woman in a blue kimono plays the Japanese shamisen, while the woman in green next to her listens. Rendered predominantly in tones of pink, peach, and greenish blue, with select areas of red and purple providing spots of contrast, the women exist in a world divorced from the polluted Thames and grimy industry signaled by the vertical smokestacks and the mountain of slag across the river. Whistler had converted the heaps of industrial waste into a modern urban counterpart to depictions of Mount Fuji in the background of many Japanese woodblock prints, including those by early 19th century artist Katsushika Hokusai. Hokusai's influence on Whistler becomes apparent when we compare Whistler's painting to one of the prints from the series 36 Views of Mount Fuji called the Sasaito Hall of the Temple. Both works feature figures on a balcony in the foreground with water and an elevated horizon line. Whistler had first been exposed to Japanese art when he lived in Paris in the 1850s. He was introduced to the work of Hokusai through a copy of Hokusai's manga a collection of informal prints. Manga was also the way that the French composer Claude Debussy was introduced to Japanese art. It was first shown to him in the 1880s by the sculptor Camille Claudel. 
Brian can tell us more about how Japanese art influenced Debussy. Thank you, Carrie, for that visually delicious segment on Whistler's Balcony and the influence of Japanese art. Yes, Debussy joined most of fin de siècle Paris in being utterly captivated by the prints of the great Japanese artists Hokusai and Hiroshige. It was almost certainly prints such as theirs that inspired his triptych for piano, estampe, which means prints. The first piece of estampe is entitled Pagode or Pagodas and uses such musical means as the pentatonic scale and gong effects to paint in sound scenes of the stunningly beautiful religious temples found in Japan, China, and other Asian countries. The pentatonic or five-tone scale corresponds to the black keys on a keyboard. And you will not, I promise, miss the gong effects in the deep bass. There's also a sense of restrained formality present throughout the piece that suggests the manner of an elegant Japanese tea or religious ceremony. Here is Pagode by Claude Debussy.
What a gorgeous piece of music that is. As Brian noted, Debussy references an art term in his title, estampe, meaning prince. In other works by the composer, he uses titles such as image, sketch, and scene. This blurring of the lines between visual art and music is suggestive of Whistler, who used musical terms in his painting titles, calling them symphonies, arrangements, harmonies, and nocturnes. The term nocturne was suggested to Whistler by one of his patrons, Frederick Leyland, to describe Whistler's dark, atmospheric paintings of nighttime landscapes. Leyland was Whistler's primary patron for several years, and Whistler's famous peacock room was painted for him. Leyland was also an amateur pianist, and he borrowed the nocturne label from Chopin's piano works of the same name. We'll hear one of them later in the program. Debussy was inspired by Whistler rather than Chopin when he composed his orchestral nocturnes in the 1890s. This vivid pastel is a preliminary study for a two-panel screen in the style known as Japanesque that Whistler painted for Leyland in 1872. We're looking over the Thames towards London with the Chelsea clock tower in the background behind the bridge to the left. The foreground is dominated by the expanse of the old timber Battersea Bridge with its scaffolding on the left, visually balanced by the rising moon on the right. Here, Whistler is again inspired by Japanese prints, including Udagawa Hiroshige, another artist of the Edo period whose prints Whistler collected. Here is a print from Hiroshige's Eight Views of Omi called Autumn Moon at Ishiyama, the kind of image that both Whistler and Debussy collected. The landscape is serene and lyrical. The printing in this series features carefully controlled graduations of color that convey effects such as, in this print, the light of the full moon on the monochromatic nocturnal scene of mountains and lake. The Buddhist temple, embedded as it is in the landscape, is barely visible in this rendering. Thanks, Carrie. That print of the moon over the barely visible temple provides a perfect context for me to introduce a Debussy piece with one of his most evocative titles. And the moon descends on the temple that was. Already in the title, we hear the suggestion of a vast stretch of time, with the temple, probably an ancient one, perhaps only remaining in ruins. Listen for how Debussy's use of unresolved dissonances creates an aura of mystery. For example, the opening chord is one we might expect to resolve like this in the hands of an earlier composer. unresolved, and an octave higher, the chord sets the tone for a work of contemplation and wonder. It almost seems to hang in the sky, we might say, like an unresolved mystery much as the moon itself can strike us in our more poetic moments as a magnificently unresolved mystery. In this piece, we'll hear the pentatonic scale again, implying that the moon descends on an Asian temple. Indeed, it is possible that Debussy was depicting in sound the very scene from Hiroshige's Autumn Moon at Ishiyama that Kerry just showed us. During the pentatonic passages, we'll hear the suggestion of a percussion instrument called crotals in the sparkling grace notes. Debussy's And the Moon Descends on the Temple That Was.
Thank you, Brian. That was so lovely and evocative. Whistler's interest in Japanese art also contributed to his radical nocturne paintings, some of which Debussy probably saw in London in 1892. The painting so inspired him that he began composing his orchestral nocturnes immediately upon returning to Paris. About writing these works, Debussy wrote, quote, it's an experiment, in fact, in finding the different combinations possible inside a single color, as a painter might make a study in gray. Earlier in the 19th century, the Polish-French composer Frédéric Chopin wrote 21 piano pieces he called nocturnes. Many critics of the time made the connection between Whistler and Chopin. In 1886, one writer noted, quote, there's much in Mr. Whistler's treatment of nature, which, which suggests the soft melancholy and dreaminess of the modern mind. That he was more right to borrow Chopin's favorite names of nocturne and impromptu than may appear to the matter of fact and literal thinking persons. Let's look closely now at Whistler's nocturne, Lou and Silver, Battersea Reach. It depicts barges moored along the Thames to unload coal and other goods at the Chelsea docks. The chimneys and factories of Battersea appear in ghostly outlines on the opposite shore. Whistler applied a brown underpaint to the coarsely woven canvas before covering the surface with thin layers of runny blue pigment. Later, he reworked the picture and it became more gray than blue with touches of bright color defining the artificial urban light and its reflections on the river. What we can see here that is radical in this composition is Whistler's deliberate shift away from representation. Using arrangements of color and form, he seeks a dissolution of the subject matter, moving towards abstraction, relying instead on what one could call subtle tonal harmonies that replicate the abstract language of music. As Whistler himself explained, quote, by using the word nocturne, I wish to indicate an artistic interest alone, divesting the picture of any outside anecdotal interest which might have been otherwise attached to it. A nocturne is an arrangement of line, form, and color first. Thank you, Carrie. That quote of Whistler's is the perfect introduction to a work of Chopin. He, too, was always reluctant to refer explicitly to a story outside his medium of music, preferring simple generic titles like Nocturne, Waltz, Mazurka, and Ballade, among others, without additional descriptive modifiers. He has been called the reluctant romantic, in part because he wanted the music to speak entirely for itself. He would have liked Whistler's description of his own nocturnes as, quote, arrangements of line, form, and color first. Carey used words like moody and atmospheric to describe Whistler's nocturnes, words that also capture much of the emotional territory explored in Chopin's nocturnes. Opus 27, number one, is in the somber key of C-sharp minor. If that key were represented by a color, it would be a color very much like the hues of Whistler's Nocturne Blue and Silver, Battersea Reach. Chopin's Nocturne tells a vivid and wide-ranging story. But what connects it so perfectly to Whistler's Nocturnes is that it tells an entirely musical story with nary a hint of an external or concrete reference. It is a story in musical line, form, and color first.
What a transcendent performance. Let's now look at how Whistler deployed his approach to nocturnes to represent reflections in water, specifically the canals of Venice and Amsterdam. In 1885, Whistler visited Amsterdam and for the first time painted several nocturnes in watercolor. In this work, Whistler plays with the reflections, the geometric facades of the buildings, whose incandescent yellow and red lights are mirrored on the surface of the canal below. He uses many layers of wide vertical strokes to create a rhythm of light and dark rectangles. Whistler blotted and even sanded the layers of paint, what he called his sauce, to create an even chromatic unity of sky and water. The artist was inspired by the waterbound cities of both Amsterdam and Venice, where he lived for more than a year and created a series of etchings and pastels. Finding visual inspiration in the formal qualities of water, light, and reflection, he created moods and tonalities that transported the viewer. Not surprisingly, perhaps, Debussy also found inspiration in reflections, as Brian will explain. That's right, Carrie. Debussy was inspired by reflections to compose one of his greatest works for the piano, the first of his images, or image, for solo piano, reflections in the water. Indeed, Debussy found inspiration in all aspects of nature. Here's one of my favorite quotes from DBC that speaks to this inspiration. Quote, I love music passionately, and because I love it, I try to free it from barren traditions that stifle it. It is a free art gushing forth, an open air art, boundless as the elements, the wind, the sky, the sea. It must never be shut in and become an academic art." End quote. We can almost hear Whistler cheering Debussy on as he declares his freedom from stifling tradition. And that declaration of freedom is on brilliant display in reflections in the water. One small example among many. Listen to this interesting chord. Resolve it the way tradition implies I should, it would go here. But on the very first page of Reflections in the Water, Debussy proceeds this way from that chord. you find those harmonies as fascinating and beguiling as I do. Listen also for how Debussy's use of the pedal liquefies the sound throughout the piece. I'd like to share a personal experience. I will never forget that as a boy listening to a recording of Reflections in the Water, I felt I could see music for the very first time. I saw the sun in the rapid runs sparkling and glistening on the water. I'm not sure I even made the connection then that in a work entitled Images, of course Debussy was painting with sound. And only years later did I learn just how intimately connected to the visual arts Debussy's music is. Thank you, Carrie, for giving us so much of Whistler's visual beauty from which to draw inspiration as we listen to and perhaps even see this marvelous piece of music. Debussy's Reflections in the Water.
I think JBC's Reflections makes a perfect finale to our program today. I want to thank you all for coming to this latest installment of Look and Listen. I hope you enjoyed this musical journey, which allowed us to explore the capacity of music and visual art to both intersect and inspire one another, thereby producing an experience that both ignites our senses and sparks our imaginations. I want to thank Brian Gans for that stunning performance. I'd also like to thank Michael Wilpers and Hatomo and the entire technical team that produced our show today. I'm Carrie Roeder, signing off and wishing you peace and well-being until our next program. Goodbye. <laughs>